hope you know that harvesting and preserving season isn't just a phrase from the past. In fact, it's never been more relevant than now, given everything that's going on. The fact is, when you're equipped with a canner, dehydrator, and a freezer, you become the savviest shopper and gardener around. And someone that will consistently eat cheaper, better quality foods than anyone else. In this month's Pantry Chat, this will be your one-stop shop for August. I'm not holding anything back. I'll tell you the seasonal produce to buy and what to do with it when you get it home. I'll share several delicious canning recipes you'll want to have on your shelves for this fall and winter. We'll head to the garden to gather ingredients for delicious summer recipes you can have on your plate this evening because we are harvesting everything, and I do mean everything, from fruits to vegetables to meats. Yep, you heard that right. We're even harvesting meat. You know the drill. Grab something to write with and cozy in. These pantry chats are meant to give a realistic picture of how anyone, but especially those of us that are pulled in many different directions, can stock a pantry that doesn't break the bank. But gives maximum nutrition, and help you get meals on the table fast. So let's start with this month's grocery guide. August is peak season for lots of fruits and vegetables. Remember, when produce is in season, it costs less and is many more times more fresh than at other parts of the year. It's also your cue to think about your preservation plan. Are you gonna freeze it, ferment it, can it, or dehydrate it? That way you have enough to last you when you can no longer source it inexpensively or grow it yourself. So the August fruits that you're gonna wanna take advantage of include apples, apricots, blackberries, blueberries, cherries, currants, figs, grapes, nectarines, peaches, pears, pine berries, plums, raspberries, strawberries, watermelons, cantaloupes, and honeydew melons. Now I'm a little partial, but the best fruits to buy this month are nectarines, peaches, and melons. It's their peak season and they should be sweet and flavorful throughout all of August. And your farmer's market will have the best tasting fruit because they're picked closer to peak ripeness. Now I always like to say that availability may vary from your area than in mine because there's this thing called the weather. For example, peaches from the southern states like Georgia lost almost 90% of their crop due to extreme weather. But you likely won't even notice this in grocery stores because the majority of peaches are actually grown in California. They produce 10 times as many peaches as Georgia. I know, all the way from California. See why you want to get your peaches from a local farmer's market? All right, so your summer vegetables are still abundant and also at their peak flavor. And this includes corn, peppers, and tomatoes. Winter squash isn't quite ready yet, so you're gonna need to wait another month. Your summer and season veggies include corn, cucumbers, eggplant, green beans, hot peppers, peas, sweet and bell peppers, sweet onions, tomatoes, zucchini, and other summer squash. Now for the free downloadable printable, click on the link below to get this month's grocery guide. Now as I told you earlier, August sits at the heart of peach season, so let me show you two delicious recipes you're gonna wanna take advantage of. Ooh, look at these beautiful summer peaches we're gonna use to make a spicy peach salsa. You'll want to dehydrate your skin so that you can make peach sugar, which is delicious in anything from sweet tea or can be used to make a simple syrup and even sprinkled on top of your morning oatmeal. Now this recipe uses lots of other seasonal ingredients that you can source from your summer garden or will be on sale and uses red jalapeno and habanero peppers. It adds just the right amount of sweet heat to pork and any seafood dish. You can find this recipe in the all new Ball Book of Canning and Preserving, which I'll link below. After you dice up your ingredients, you combine everything in a Dutch oven and then bring it to a boil to dissolve the sugar and then you're going to allow it to simmer for several minutes. You'll ladle everything into hot jars and process it in a boiling water bath for 10 minutes adjusting for altitude. Yep, this recipe is that easy. And don't forget to save your peach pits to make a homemade vinegar. Our peach skins are now dried and crisp and ready to be placed into a blender along with several scoops of sugar, and I'm using brown sugar. Now this will keep for up to a year and is delicious sprinkled on top of a morning bowl of oatmeal. Try it and let me know what you think. 
Enjoying a summer peach with ripe juices running down your chin is a bit of heaven, and one of my favorite ways to prepare them is to make baked peaches with an oatmeal crumb topping dolloped with homemade whipped cream and raspberries. This recipe is perfect as a dessert, for breakfast, or even a summer snack. Once you've assembled your oatmeal crumb topping, set that aside and grab your peaches. Cut them in half, remove the pit, and place the pit in a jar full of vinegar. You'll leave this at room temperature in a dark place sealed for three weeks. You can use this in anything from dresses to simple sauces or spooned over fish. It'll store in the fridge for up to six months. You're now watching me make a brown sugar glaze made by combining melted butter, brown sugar, and a few drops of vanilla. We'll drizzle this over the peaches. Now let's layer our peaches with our oatmeal crumb topping. I think you can start to see how divine this is going to taste. All right, let's pop those in the oven so we can move on to making our homemade whipped topping. Pour cold, heavy whipping cream into your mixer along with powdered sugar and any chosen flavoring. Vanilla is most popular, but don't limit yourself. Coconut extract, almond extract, lavender, and maple syrup are just a few of the flavor possibilities you can use to enhance whipped cream. Store in an airtight container for up to five days. Homemade whipped topping tastes vastly superior to the store stuff and is worth making since it comes together so quickly. I'm going to plate my peaches on this platter, but let me show you how one looks fully assembled. Take your tender baked peach with the crunchy oatmeal crumbs, then dollop on as much whipped cream as you want. Top with a firm raspberry, but then garnish a few around the plate. Now tell me this doesn't look good. Let's take a bite. The tender peach, crisp crumble, whipped topping, and subtle tartness from the raspberry are perfection. Can you imagine the smiles you'll get when you bring this platter to the table? Now this is homemade summer goodness. our first time meeting. Hi, I'm Cassandra from the blog becomingafarmgirl.com. I'm here to help you start canning delicious recipes your family will love and show you how to live a farm fresh life without land or livestock. Click on the link below to start getting candy recipes and videos delivered straight to your inbox. If you've already signed up, this is already in your email. Now, if you haven't seen my garden, it is entirely green stalk planters. And this is what allows me to plant over 200 herbs, fruits, and vegetables just on a townhouse deck. And every year, y'all know I get carried away with planting too much basil, sage, and rosemary, but they are just the trifecta of flavor. Now, I'm in zone 7A, B, and so I can grow herbs starting in late spring through early fall. Y'all, that's over half the year. And baby, the potency that fresh herbs bring to any meal can't be beat. So when I was in the grocery store the other day picking up 10 ears of corn for $2, which was an incredible price, I tipped over to the herb section and I had to pick my jaw up off the floor. I harvest herbs on my deck by the hand and basket full. And many of these herbs are ones that come back year after year. So seeing that I would be paying nearly $3 for herbs that just kind of looked meh and would barely be a handful was shocking and really made me realize that yes, year after year, having an herb garden is so economical. Plus, I never have to be disappointed that they've sold out of herbs or experienced sticker shock. Now let me circle back to sage, an herb that sadly only gets attention around Thanksgiving. I have a sage recipe that will change your life and have you using it year round if you preserve it this way. Come closer. You need to start making sage jelly. Here's why and how you'll use it. This is the texture of sage jelly and you can either strain the herbs or leave them in. You'll really enjoy using your sage jelly in a sausage breakfast casserole. 
after you cook your sausage, add a bit of chopped onion to a pan with fresh or stale breadcrumbs, cheddar cheese, and stir to combine to create a delicious sweet savory glaze that's addicting. Meatballs and spaghetti are regular menu items, but try switching it up by creating a sweet sage glaze seasoned with hot pepper flakes. The jelly melts and coats your meatballs, creating a sweet spicy sauce combination that pairs well with any meat. Restaurant-worthy pan-fried pork chops are attainable at home, and sage jelly is your secret ingredient. After completing a light sear, remove your chops and cut up some onions and a few red apples to the same pan. Return the pork chops to the skillet, then dollop with your sage jelly until you see those juices bubbling up. The smell of your kitchen is intoxicating by now. Pork and sage are perfect partners, and the crunch from the softened apples and onions are wonderful accents and a way to get a filling, simple, yet delicious meal on the table. This recipe is on my blog, and a dedicated cooking and canning video is here on my channel. All right, let's head to my deck garden to harvest some rosemary and sage, which have been growing abundantly since late spring. Even in early August, the superior condition of my herbs, compared to what I see in stores, continues to amaze me. Once back inside, I'll pull the sage leaves from the stem and do the same with the rosemary. Then I'll give everything a rough chop. To make rosemary sage burgers, take equal parts ground beef and ground pork and mix to combine. Then add a combination of rosemary and sage and again fold that in. Add a bit of salt and blend that in with your hands. That's it. I've been using this little burger kit that I found and I really like it. It comes with a burger press and a measuring cup for quarter pound patties. And then you get these separating discs designed with dimples to ensure that the patties maintain their shape while cooking and it keeps the patties from sticking together. And yep, I found this at the thrift store for under five bucks. You can press and store six a quarter pound or third of a pound burger patties, and I like that it's compact and easy to store. I have a meat grinder, and so this makes shaping my own burgers a no-brainer. After you use the scoop to measure out the quantities, you drop it in the container, spread it a bit with your hands, top it with the dimpled disc, and then use the burger press to flatten out and shape your meat. Yep, that's all you do. Now let's make some sage rosemary burgers. Here's what I really like about this kit. It lets me prep and store my burgers in advance. It's Sunday, but y'all, this is Wednesday's meal. The same container I used to make the burgers is what you store it in. Okay, now it's actually Wednesday. I headed to the garden to harvest some green onions. Then I chopped them up and added a few spoonfuls of homemade fermented sour cream, a bit of pepper, and stirred everything to combine. I wanted to top this with apple slaw, so I used a tart apple to make a slaw by grating it, then added olive oil, lemon juice, and salt. Okay, let's get those burgers back out and fry them up. Oh my word. Now don't these look delicious already? The separating disc is nonstick and easy to remove. Here's the flat side and here's the dimpled side. I got the burgers on heat and in a separate pan, I seared my bun. While that's cooking, I harvested some chard since I don't have any lettuce at the moment. All right, let's get this thing assembled. We'll spread our sauce on the top and the bottom bun, add our hot juicy burger, top it with the apple slaw, and then a few pieces of chard. You've got sauce, you've got savory, you've got crunch and potent herb flavor that can't be missed. We love this summertime burger and I'm sure your family will too. I've got basil growing all over the place, which is a glorious situation to be in. So I think the garden is telling me it's time to make some pesto that I can freeze to enjoy this winter. No store-bought brands can rival homemade pesto sauce, so what you're seeing here is how an everyday cook can experience gourmet taste at home from their backyard for pennies on the dollar. The great thing about pesto is that you can vary the nuts you use. Pine nuts are expensive, so walnuts or almonds are great substitutes, but people with nut allergies may be able to eat pine nuts, which are technically seeds. I'm adding the entire basil cutting, including the stems, because it blends smoothly, has potent flavor just like the leaves, and leaves no waste. Oh my word, look at this beautiful pesto, y'all. 
Whoever left the comment on my last video to lay a cutting board on the counter first, then place your silicone tray on top so that it's easy to lift once it's filled is an angel. Thank you, I love this hack. Now I like to use silicone cupcake trays to portion out serving sizes. Once this freezes, I'll just pop them out and place them in a gallon size bag so that I can make as much or as little as I want at any time. This is a second batch that I'm keeping in the fridge for meals this week. Now you could just as easily use these leak proof freezer lids, but I find that the generic regular lids work just as fine too. A few months ago, I found Cavatappi noodles, which Reed Drummond from the Pioneer Woman introduced me to, and I love using these when I make pesto pasta. Of course, any noodle works, and I found this brand at Aldi. Let's head back out to the garden to harvest some cherry tomatoes. I'm using some homemade plant wash, which is just a vinegar dilution that I keep in this bottle to clean my tomatoes before I slice them. The summer sun has these tasting so good. After I've drained the noodle water, I'll pour some chicken broth into the pan and add a few scoops of pesto. Then I'll add some milk, either half and half, a full fat milk, or heavy whipping cream, whatever I have on hand. Y'all, this pesto is rich and delicious. Let's go ahead and bowl this up. My husband loves this simple little dish and loves that it represents one of the first recipes I started cooking when I started container gardening with just a few herbs and tomato plants several years ago. So sometimes y'all ask me, Cassandra, you work full time, how do you get it all done? And I am always more than happy to tell you that I don't. Thor, our dog, is about a week behind on getting his bath. Now, I am up on the wash, but the clothes are in laundry baskets scattered around the bedroom, and I don't like that. And the weeds out back are up to my waist. And I am fine with that because baths and laundry and weeds can wait. But seasonal peaches, sweet corn, and homemade spaghetti can't. If candy were something that I, or you, needed to block out for hours on end, I wouldn't be able to do it. Instead, I left small batch canning which I complete throughout the week and yes sometimes before I even go into work. During the weekday I get up about two hours early several times a week to account for my puttering and then sometimes an evening session and a bit more on the weekends. Now at this point in my life if I can get about seven hours of sleep I can manage the day so in bed at the latest by 10 and then up by 5 and then out of the house by 7 30 means that I I can front load some of my canning work. Now to be sure, at first when I started doing this, I was thinking, oh my goodness, it's gonna be rough. But now I have realized that this is the best way to start my day, even during the work week. Going out into the garden while it is cool and just being in my kitchen with my thoughts and prayers and enjoying the full body experience that is canning with the smells and the chopping and the tastes. In a way, it feels as if I am giving the first fruits to myself and my family before I leave my little cocoon and start my nine or 10 hour workday. And this is only short term. The summer months have a marked increase in the frequency of my canning. But this is also the time of year where my pantry fills up the fastest with fruits and vegetables and meats that we'll be eating all year. And the shelf life is good beyond that. Plus y'all know when I'm in the kitchen is when I catch up on my YouTube time. I got this little stand from my phone and honey, you can't tell me anything. I also catch up with like video chatting with my folks to show them recipes that I'm working on. Let me show you what my weekday canning routine usually looks like. All right, y'all, it is another early morning and my goal for the next, uh, I got a little over two hours, is just to, um, I already shook the corn last night, so if I can just foil it so that I can remove the kernels and pressure can it, that would be awesome. And then I have a bunch of onions that I need to dice up because I also want to make either Good morning, Booba. <laughs> you hear his little nails on the on the floor. And um, yeah, so I want to dice up those onions so that I can roast them. And that would just save me so much time so that I can use it for either marinara or spaghetti sauce. Um, so let's get started. 
While the water is heating on the stove, I'm pulling out an onion chopper that I picked up at the thrift store the other day. How I lived without one for so long is beyond me, but not this canning season, and especially because I want to prepare my onions, which are a mix of red, white, and sweet onions. If you aren't already, consider how you'll split the prep work into one session and the actual cooking in another. This will keep you from feeling overwhelmed. Most of us can find 20 to 30 minutes, maybe even an hour of time to dedicate to a task, but more than that is often challenging. My pot of water has reached a boil, so I'm transferring the corn to blanch it for a few minutes. I'm setting aside some raw corn to toss into a simple corn salad. Now, if you don't have a corn cutter, you can just as easily use a sharp knife, which is my mom's preference. Some folks toss out the ears of their corn at this point, but not you and I, because we're gonna scrape the bare cob with the back of a knife to release the corn milk. A naturally sweet, starchy liquid, perfect for adding flavor and texture to anything from soups to salad dressing, sauces, corn pudding, and more. You can literally see the milk expel from the kernels. So here's the regular corn, but now here's the kernels cut from the cob, which is hollowed out. Watch this. To the left is cut corn, and to the right are cut kernels with the milk. You can pressure can both versions as the milk is actually non-dairy, but milked corn needs extra processing time. Both versions are super sweet, but you can truly see the milk seep from the kernels, which adds incredible flavor. My corn is blanched, so I'm removing it from the pot of boiling water. While you don't have to blanch your corn, some folks swear it helps with the flavor, but I like doing it just because it eases the kernels off the cob. After you blanch it, the kernels nearly slide right off, and it won't matter what kind of kernel remover you use. Home canned corn often has kernels that clump together, like this. While pressure canning breaks most of it down, I've come to love seeing those knitted kernels on my plate as proof positive that the corn was hand cut using seasonal corn from a local grower. This is a proud pantry moment. Here's the corn we've got so far. Not bad for 30 minutes worth of morning work. Let's get this transferred into clean jars. Doing this several times throughout the month is how I stock my pantry full of jars that'll last us through the winter and spring. I love using four jars lids because they've given me the highest seal rate out of all the brands I've used, and they come with marked space to write the date and ample room for labeling. You can use my code FARMGIRL10 to take 10% off your order. You'll secure your lids with a screw band that is tightened to just fingertip tight. Corn is a pressure canning recipe. Process pint-sized jars for 55 minutes and quart-sized jars for 85 minutes. Y'all know I'm crazy about my corn stock, which I rank as one of the best tasting stocks, rivaling that of chicken stock. You'll never see this on your grocery store shelves, but as a canner, it's a free byproduct that you get when you can corn. Just save your ears and roast them with some onion skins and herbs. I had lots of celery and rosemary from the garden, so I used that this time. Now that we've got our oven on, let's add the diced onions to several pans so that they can caramelize. This will add tons of deep, nuanced flavor. Man, that little onion chopper really sped this task up. I'm setting aside some raw onions in this jar for other recipes that I'll use later on in the week. Okay, I've gotta get a move on packing our lunches for today. So I'm gonna grab some bacon grease to oil my cast iron and then use a loaf of clearance ciabatta bread, originally priced at $3.29, marked down to $1.64 toast it, and then spread some goat cheese on the bottom slice, add some of the shredded chicken that I made earlier in the week, slice some tomatoes, and then add the delicious pesto. Y'all have seen me use this 10 lunch pail for almost five years now. Yes, it's just that good and holding up well. I love packing our lunches in these because they don't retain stains or smells. I added some sliced peaches, and since the sandwich is so hearty, this should tie us over until dinner. With the lunches packed, all I have left to do is take out the onions and add them to a bag. I'm going to take the roasted corn cobs and transfer them to the roaster that I'll keep on for about three hours. When my neighbor, Monica, comes over to walk my dog, she'll turn it off for me. All right, I've got to remove the corn from the canner and let it rest. So I'm taking those delicious jars out now. Awesome, I have met my goal for this morning. Now let me take off my apron, throw on my blazer, grab my work bag, lunch, keys, and head off to work. Good morning, y'all. So what I need to get done before I head out this morning 
is a couple of things that will just set me up. So this morning, I wanna take that second box that I have over on the dining room table, bring it in, uh, wash the tomatoes, and then go ahead and roast them in the oven so that all I have to do when I get home this evening is run them through my tomato strainer, which I also need to set up. I'm gonna set that up right here on my food mill. I'll show you how I do that. And I just like doing that. I need to get my jars up um, to make sure I have enough. I just like being able to, you know, when I come home, it just makes it easier for me to transition right into canning if I already have the stuff at least laid out. So I'm gonna do that. Um, we already prepped the onions and stuff yesterday. And then what else did I wanna do? That's right, I need to shuffle around some containers that are in my fridge because I wanna use those bottles for my vinegars because I am drowning in fruit scraps. And so, I mean, vinegars are just so easy to make and the flavor payoff is amazing. So I'm gonna show you that project too. Let's go ahead and get started. I scored these organic Roma tomatoes at my local farmer's market for just 20 bucks, which will yield at least eight to 10 quarts of tomato sauce. See, these tomatoes are still firm enough, but let's wash them because we're going to use the skins. Next, I'll preheat the oven and head outside to water the garden. Here's my deck garden, where I grow over 200 herbs, veggies, fruits, and flowers. As I wait and save for our homestead, this keeps me busy. Y'all, look at how well my eggplant is growing. With coffee in one hand and a hose in the other, it's that easy to water your vertical planters. During the summer, using insect covers over my planters is a must to keep pest pressure low and protect my crops. It's like growing in a greenhouse. You can use my code BAFARMGIRL to take $10 off your order. Back inside, it's time to get our clean tomatoes in the oven. I've lined some roaster pans for easy cleaning and I'm going to slice the tomatoes. I'm also gonna reserve some for another recipe. But do y'all see all of these tomatoes? <laughs> Whoa, let's get them in the oven. The next part of my morning work is to change out these bottles. I recently discovered these Pyrex bottles, which I want to use for my condiments, like my fermented ketchups and salad dressings, and I'll use the bottles for my vinegars. I'll leave a link in the description box below. These eight ounce bottles are self-standing and made from food grade materials. You can even use them in boiling water and in the microwave. It's easy to assemble and break apart. I'm glad I got these and over the next year, I'll likely get a few more. All right, I've brought up my tomato food mill, which I purchased secondhand last season and is super easy to assemble. I'll let the tomatoes cool and continue this evening. Time for work. I bought a stainless steel plunger that I use for this and my ferments. You'll use the plunger to press the tomatoes through the hopper. You'll have sauce coming out on one side and skins and seeds cranking out on the other side. Remember, if you're canning your sauce, you must remove the skins because they have a higher bacterial load and approved recipes for processing times only use skinless tomatoes. You'll want to immediately transfer your sauce to heat so that it doesn't separate in your jars as it cools, creating a line of demarcation of pulp and juice in your jars. Now the product is still safe if it does, but what canner doesn't like to look at pretty jars on her shelf? You're gonna let your sauce simmer until it reduces by at least a third, but up to half according to the thickness you desire. We aren't done with those skins and seeds yet, You've come this far, so why not dehydrate them and make your own tomato powder, perfect for creating a tomato broth in your stews, or making tomato salt, which has incredible flavor. Yup, that consistency is perfect. I can't wait to enjoy this over homemade pasta. I ended with a total of seven quarts to can, but I set aside two pint jars to cook with this week. And remember, I still had two dozen tomatoes reserved for another recipe. I've recently started indoor composting and I'm really enjoying it because I can turn harder to compost items like meat skins and bones into fertilizer for my garden. You just top with Bokashi brand and it basically ferments your food waste. Now, if this isn't your first time in my kitchen, you already know that I suffer from OCD obsessive canning delight. And I'm going to share another characteristic of someone with this condition because you might have it too. So a good half of my canning jar collection has been thrifted from ladies that refer to themselves as retired canners that enjoyed canning for their now adult children. And some of their jars were passed on to them from their mothers. And so as a result, some of my canning jars date back to the 1930s. Now, no, these jars aren't monetarily valuable. 
but they still have a lot of sentimental value to me. I think about the years of canning recipes that my jars already contain and the decades of recipes that they will store for me and my family. I am stewarding these jars from the ladies that I purchased them from and that feels good. So several years ago, I picked up some jars from a lady who was selling hers, and she actually wrote the dates on the bottom of her jars of when that particular jar was in production. And y'all, this jar was in production from 1933 through 1962. And you can tell by like the font of the word ball and then the different words that they have here. So this is the perfect mason. And then this jar was just in production from 1975 to 1976 and it's the easy pack mason. I mean, how cool is that? I'll leave a link to a website that helps you to date your ball jars. The other day when I was at the thrift store, I couldn't believe that I came across a Roma Top clay roaster which retail at 70 bucks and up. So I knew that $8.99 was a steal and at least worth experimenting with. When I got home, I washed it up, and since I wanted to bake a whole chicken in it, I followed the instructions that said that you have to soak the lid. So I placed the bird in the bottom portion, removed the neck, the heart, and the liver, and then headed to the garden to get a mix of herbs to season the chicken with. You know, sage, thyme, chives, and celery sounded like a good mix to me, so that's what I brought in the house. I gave everything a rough chop and then added a tablespoon of oil, which I should not have because the steaming action locks in moisture without the need for added oil or fat. I actually knew that, but I just was in disbelief and ugh, yeah, that was a mistake. I actually had to pour out drippings twice from the pan because so much liquid had built up. This truly is a healthy cooking method. The moisture on this chicken was no joke. Just look at the results. been drowning in quail eggs recently. I mean, look at all these eggs that I need to figure out what to do with. Yep, you've heard that right. And for those of y'all that have been with me for a while, you've probably been wondering how my journey into keeping quail has been going since I haven't mentioned it for a while. Um, it's kind of like this. This is footage from more than a year ago because I was supposed to be able to tell you about the day my quail eggs arrived and how excited I was to incubate them. I ordered my eggs from My Shire Farm and every egg arrived in perfect condition and the packaging was stellar. Zach, the owner, provided thorough instructions and a magnetic card that I could place on the fridge to track my lockdown date. About two weeks before this, I had purchased a mid-tier incubator and while nervous, I felt that I could manage things on my own. So after I placed the eggs in the incubator and fixed the temperature and humidity, I transported the incubator to my basement laundry room to lock it down. I noted everything on the magnetic strip, but then... I had trouble maintaining the temperature. I tried a dozen things that I had read online, but then I was up against the time with my eggs. After replacing my hatching eggs twice, I just gave up. Now a saying that my granddaddy had was go with your first mind. And remember when I told y'all when I was initially thinking about quail that ideally I would want to connect with someone that was already successfully raising them so that I didn't have to go into this thing cold. I mean YouTube videos and books are great but I don't think it replaces in-person guidance. I mean, especially for someone who would be a complete novice. I mean, my first time touching a quail would be when it hatched. Properly caring for poultry or any homestead animal for that matter requires that you are prepared to handle the worst case and common problems. That often means being able to dispatch the bird and understanding common disease symptoms and treatments. So. I just went back to buying a dozen of quail eggs at the farmer's market. Until about two weeks ago, I grabbed the fact sheet that is right there by the quail eggs while I was in line and I read it 
thoroughly and I noticed that the owner's name was right on the bottom of the sheet and her telephone number. So I got a small flutter of hope and I said, you know, maybe it's worth it if I reach out to her and ask if I could volunteer and help her with her quail or maybe at the very least she would just sell me some. So I mustered up the courage and did just that. The worst she could tell me was no. So as I called her and relayed my hatching problems, she immediately shared like a dozen different reasons and solutions that, you know, it never would have dawned on me. So we fell into this cadence of the conversation and somewhere she said something about how quail eggs aren't uh, pasteurized. Most of them um, are not and they don't uh, run the risk of salmonella. And I remember saying to that that I buy her eggs specifically because they aren't pasteurized and that I already drink raw milk. And that kind of shifted like the tone a little bit more in her voice. And she was like, hold on, where do you get your raw milk? And I was like, oh, I get it from Kelly from Hensing Farm. And she's like, that's where I go. And then, I mean, from there, we just went on this tangent for like the next 10 minutes talking about just so much. We hit things off pretty quickly. And so by the end of the conversation, she was like, hey, sure, you know, come on over. And uh, yeah, I started the very next week. So since late spring, I've been going over to Crystal's about twice a week and helping out with quail chores and learning so much from her. She has about 200 quail, mostly Caternix, but then she also has a few of the Celadon quail and those are the ones that lay the blue eggs. She also has meat birds and a flock of Rhode Island Reds all there in her suburban backyard. She's been doing this for years and because the quail are part of her business, she does things by the book and I am learning so many things from her that you just don't here on YouTube. When she's explaining something to me and maybe I still have some questions, it just feels so incredible to be able to say like, hold on, like why did you do it this way? Or could I do it this way? Or, you know, what does that mean? And get an immediate answer with um, information and facts and experiences behind it. I mean, you are just, you're not gonna get that off of a YouTube video or a book. So no, I don't have quail in my backyard just yet, but not being able to hatch those eggs has been the biggest blessing. By volunteering, I have scaled my knowledge in just under a season in ways that I would not have been able to do on my own. And I am so thankful for this because I mean, time is, time is limited between work and trying to do uh, the quail and the canning and life. I just, I mean, there are lots of pitfalls that I know I would have run into if it was just me and I wouldn't have had anyone else's expertise and Oh, that's so valuable. And also the reason I wanted quail is so that we could source a portion of our eggs and meat. And quite honestly, I'm able to do that now without having to give up even any of the tiny space in our townhouse backyard lot. Plus I now know definitively what to buy and to avoid, and I can fold that into our budget over the next year. I mean, when you go online, there are companies that just wanna sell you anything. And you know, if you're someone like me, you just, you really don't know. And so I now know the predator proof cage that I want to get. It's right under $200 from Manola Ranch. That's what I think I'm pronouncing that right. Um, that's the brand that Crystal uses. And she talks, she shares how the owner gives excellent customer service, how she can send a text and then he'll automatically, the owner, like call her back always uh, to address any of her questions. I know the feed and how I'm gonna source my feed, uh, the appropriate waters that I wanna use, how to install the automatic drip. Um, I mean, really, we are talking honestly about an investment of about, it could all in when I get set up, be close to four to $500 to do it right, right? And so, you know, that's not chunk, uh, chunk change. And so now I'm confident spending that amount of money because I am confident in what I'm getting. I'm already going to know how to work it. Um, these are excellent kind of building uh, materials. I will have this on our, you know, small homestead when we move. And I mean, that is just that is peace of mind. Now I haven't been showing y'all any footage because it is just extremely hard to film when I'm over there. When I'm over there, we're either trying to beat this oppressive heat and humidity that we've been having, 
or these unpredictable rainstorms. There's not really a good place for me to set my camera and when I get my work gloves on and I'm handling the poop trays, it just, so now you know how I've been able to source all of my quail eggs and I encourage you to do the same thing to connect with poultry or garden growers in your area if you're in the same space that I'm in. Since I've got all these quail eggs and I have a KitchenAid, I figured why not make homemade pasta since the recipe just requires flour, eggs, and water. So I got to work, switching my attachments and sifting some all-purpose flour. You'll need about four to five quail eggs to equal one chicken egg, so I got out my quail scissors, which makes opening them a cinch. Quail eggs have been known to improve immunity, bone health, manage diabetes, promote healthy skin, and prevent hair loss. Quail eggs have a rich, creamy flavor that is milder compared to chicken eggs and have a delicate texture with a smoother consistency. The yolk to white ratio is higher in quail eggs, resulting in a more intense yolk flavor. This was my first time using the dough hook and whoa, I'm impressed at how well it worked. After everything is combined, you'll knead it by hand for several minutes and then let it rest. You can store pre-made pasta dough in the fridge for up to two days and since I want to make a large batch, I'm going to complete this project over the next two days. So that's not where the quail story ends because about two weeks ago, Crystal called me and she was like, were you serious when you mentioned that you wanted to learn how to butcher a chicken? And I told her, yeah, I'm absolutely serious. And then that's when she shared with me that there was going to be this event at someone else's farm where she and a couple of other people that also have meat birds just all get together and they process all of their meat birds on that day. And really it's an efficient process because, you know, everything is set up and you have so many hands on deck helping um, that it makes the work go, you know, extremely easy. And so I was like, oh my gosh, because I mean, when you think about this, y'all, Last year when I was at the Homesteaders of America conference, I mean, that would have been, for folks like in my, um, that you don't have access to a farm, like that's how you have to like, you know, do it and experience it. And I'm so thankful for that. Um, but I was going to get a much more, you know, personalized experience. I mean, right up the road, like 15 minutes away. And so I just... I just couldn't believe it. But then, and I'm kind of new to this, so I'm sorry if, the way that I explain it, it's not gonna be the best, um, sorry. So the guy's house that we were going to go to was showing his chickens at the fair that's currently going on. And I guess when you do that, they will allow you, like you can just, they'll process the birds like for you, but it's at a, you know, like a manufacturer, like a company or like a business does it for you. Um, but Crystal was like, Ugh, I don't know if I wanna, you know, just go through the hassle of transporting my birds and stress and the packing and all that other kind of stuff. And so she, when she was calling me, when we were having this conversation, she was like, so hey, like how do you feel about it just being, you know, me and you? And I portrayed a tone of confidence. <laughs> and I was like, of course, like Crystal, if you know, I'll probably be slow in the beginning. So if you're okay with, you know, teaching me and hopefully I'm not gonna be slowing you down, I would love to. But in my mind, I was freaking out a little bit because I was like, oh my goodness, I thought I was gonna do this in a group. I wasn't asking for one-on-one -on -one lessons. But at the same time, I was like, wow, how did this fall into my lap? The ability to get one-on-one -on -one instruction and guidance and immediate feedback on this process was just, I mean, that's hard to access. At least I'm thinking in my mind um, that it would be. And so I was very much looking forward to, to learning um, how to dispatch a chicken or to harvest chickens because y'all, I mean, the name of my channel is called Becoming a Farm Girl because yeah, like what you're watching is me imperfectly and learning along the way, scaling towards becoming a farm girl. And it also describes the, the other folks that, you know, I wanna meet along um, this journey, others that are becoming or became farm girls. So there's this phrase that I think explains my call towards homesteading because I just wanna keep this uh, part quick. And it's that you just, you just know when you're knower. And that's what it's been like for me. There are so many experiences uh, with homesteading that I still need to have. 
Um, but each step I take in this direction, it's only confirmed that on a small scale, um, you know, that this is what I want to do. And so I was not nervous. Um, there was a little excitement in terms of being able to know that I could do this process and to do it well. Um, because there is an art of uh, dispatching and being able to butcher the bird and all of those things. And, you know, I think I have been showing y'all the closest that I could get. Oh, yeah, I am getting a little emotional. That's weird. The closest that I could get for so long would be, um, has been just to like buy a whole bird at the grocery store. And as I told you, like in my mind, I would just tell myself, that one day, you know, it's going to be um, one of my chickens that I've grown um, and raised and that they were out, you know, to pasture and their feet felt the grass. And, you know, there's just that one, you know, bad day that they have. And so now that I've done it, um, certainly uh, a store-bought chicken is very different, both in size and then they're cold and they've already done a lot of the cleaning kind of for you. But um, I was really looking forward to um, to our time. Hold on. Woo. So, okay. So as y'all know, like I said, my dad is actually a farm boy because Big Mama, so his grandma, um, like they had their own uh, homestead. And then he would, when they would go visit her on the weekends and stuff, like my dad's been all around it. So I gave him a call the morning of um, the event. And here's what he had to say. Dad, <laughs> today's the day. For what? Butchering chickens. Oh. <laughs> I was just calling you really quickly to see if you had any words of last minute encouragement. <laughs> Dad, I I get the okay. gist. When she butchered the chickens, is she just basically gonna put their neck inside this thing and use a a butcher's knife to? Yeah. Chop the neck off. So do you know Miss Fanny? She lives in the other townhouse that has a front porch like hours further back. The older okay. woman. Yeah. So um, I was visiting with her because I brought her some quail eggs yesterday. And I told her that I was going to um, do this tomorrow. And I was and I asked her the same question. You know, do you have any advice? And she was like, it's going to be traumatizing. And I was like, Miss Fanny. <laughs> she said, let me tell you, after you take that axe, and you cut off that head, that chick is gonna be running all over the place. I didn't even realize that in my mind it was, you just don't know, you're not thinking right. So I'm like, you're, you've always used a kill cone, but you have not. But then I was like, oh, that is truly the phrase, running around like a chicken with your head cut off. So you've pulled out the guts and all that out of a chicken before? No, dad, I haven't done anything before. <laughs> okay, you've pulled the guts out of fish before though. Oh yeah, out of fish and out of the chicken from the store, but they've already cleaned that. So that's not the whole thing. Yeah, that's not, but I don't, that, that's not the part that I'm like anxious about at all. Like, but it really is just the initial. Of course, they're gonna make sure that the blade is is, is, is nice and sharp. Right, and then you pick it up by the feet out of the cone and then, you know, dunk uh, it. Oh, y'all really, oh, now see, like I said, what we always did it was, um, we always had this, um, I don't know whether you remember that we had this, that one tree stump that I had in the yard. Okay. Put logs and stuff on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. These birds are big and they're only maybe, I think between like 13 to 16 weeks and they are huge. Oh, uh, feeding them some good stuff, huh? But yeah, uh, you should be okay. Okay. Yeah. A good experience. Yeah, you, you're talking about becoming a farm girl. Um, part of becoming a farm girl is you have to be able to do that. Right. I'll see you on the other side. <laughs> okay. So then after I talked to my dad, I called my brother. And my brother has no interest in farm life at all, but I wanted to keep him posted on what Big Sis was doing. And so, I mean, he cheesed me a little bit. But uh, he was encouraging. What's up? He's still in bed. <laughs> I was just talking to Dad. Oh, I was just talking to Dad, actually. Robert, t today's the day. Today is August 2nd. <laughs> no, not a date. Butchering chickens. Yes. 
I'm gonna do it today, Rob. I just called dad for like, a, like a moral, like, you know, just like a, or, yes. If it just, if you're learning it as it's happening, it, it kind of makes, sometimes it's easier. We're so far removed. Like you eat meat all the time, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. you're just removing those intermediate steps. Right. Yeah. You know, when they say from, from, you know, from farm to table, you know, that's, that's what they mean, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know that dispatching birds is not everyone's thing, um, but for me, it was definitely a, a sense of accomplishment. It was a combination of seeing that I could do it, and we dispatched a total of 13 birds, and um, Crystal did the first three, so it kind of gave me perspective on like different scenarios that could happen, and then after that, I took it away. Now those birds were big. They were like 20 pounds and plus. And so she would lift them into the cones for me just because I didn't want that to be a traumatic experience <laughs> for me or the birds. Just trying to like, you know, lift them into um, the kill cone. But I also have just realized um, and that I'm so, so appreciative for the online uh, community and other farm girls that I'm meeting here. On the channel i think that um even going to my first ever conference last year the homesteaders of america conference you really feel like you um you know are finding your tribe of folks because this is so you know contrary still it's gaining you know popularity but still on a very small scale um unfortunately and you know i um believe it or not y'all i actually am kind of introverted <laughs> Um, but you can, um, and certainly like being around a homestead, like a lot of it is done like here in your house. And I love the friendship that I am building with Crystal, you know, like we're, we're two, you know, girls that get together and our time together is hard and fast and purposeful, right? We're working. Um, but we, she, the passion that she has, um, as she works is just, it's awesome and I love I love being able to just be her under her understudy and um, to learn from her and to just have a friend that um, you know that that gets it and that I can just like you and like I do here um, on the channel just just ramble about these things because you don't um, you know you don't always you have to find and connect with um, at least several other folks, especially in person, um, that are your support system in all of this. And I just feel so, so lucky to have met her. And the crazy thing is, is that she's actually picking up turkeys tomorrow. Um, and so for November, we're gonna, November, we're gonna dispatch the turkeys together. We're also gonna get back together with the guy who we weren't able to go to his farm and dispatch the chicken. But we're gonna have um, a quail cookout because we need to still dispatch a number of um, the quail in the next couple of weeks to make room for um, the new ones that are coming in. And oh my gosh, like I'm actually having these new experiences and this journey of these very incremental, you know, steps that I've been taking because sometimes it does feel like, am I making any progress? What? I only can't, I, like, I remember when I just had 20 jars, candy jars in my pantry. And just, I remember when I just had one green stalk, now I have five. Um, you know, I just, it, I, I remember when I didn't even have a dehydrator, and now I have two. It just, I mean, it's been years, for sure, right? And I'm still not 100% organic kitchen, like, that kind of thing. Um, because I think your progress isn't always uh, linear, but 
you know, darn it, I, I see myself moving in the right direction and you can too, friends. So just be encouraged. It's worth it. It's worth the time that you spend um, waiting. It is worth all of the small wins. They all count. They're building your confidence and you're becoming a farm girl. Anyways, thank you for allowing me to share and ramble um, my recent experience with you. Actually, we did that on Saturday. On Sunday, I was processing, um, you know, I brought home all of like the organs and the feed. I'm trying to like, do, I was doing all those uh, chores and stuff. So um, oh, I just didn't have time to like put, put the finishing touches on this month's uh, pantry chat on the actual like weekend. Um, but you know, I, I have so many um, just pictures from that day and you know, different uh, video clips. And aside from, you know, my immediate family and my husband that are just really proud of me, you know, I can't really, it's interesting because then, you know, going back to work on Monday, it was like, how was your weekend? And, you know, you just can't, there's going to be mixed reactions. So a lot of these things I just keep to myself. Um, and because I, because I just felt so great and um, appreciated uh, just what it takes to really raise and care um, for the birds. I just, when someone has a reaction of like, ew, or something like that, you just, I, it can be deflating, you know, but I said, you know what, I think most of the farm girls here on the channel um, might kind of get it. So yeah, I just wanted to share that with you. While the summer season is a busy one, my husband and I still try to make room for a day trip or two. Now I'm in Maryland and my husband and I enjoy all the things there are to do right in our own state. And we particularly enjoy visiting some of the smaller towns and historical museums that take us not more than 90 minutes to get to. If you're a Maryland resident or you plan to come to my neck of the woods someday, you may want to take a trip to St. Michael's. On an overnight trip to St. Michael's, I had the chance to visit the Chesapeake Maritime Museum, which is home to a collection of Chesapeake Bay artifacts, exhibitions, and vessels. This 18-acre interactive museum was founded in 1965 on Navy Point, once the site of seafood packing houses, docks, and workboats. I loved touring Hooper Strait Lighthouse, originally built in 1879 to light the way for boats passing from the Chesapeake Bay across the Tangier Sound to places like the Nanticoke and Wicomico Rivers. With support from different historical societies, the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum stepped in to save the historic structure and to lift the 42-ton lighthouse and move it to the barge 40 miles up the bay to St. Michael's. There are over 12 exhibition buildings, all nestled in a park light waterfront setting along the beautiful Miles River and St. Michael's Harbor. The essential contents of a crab meat plant can all be found at the Maryland Crab Meat Company exhibition, which shows a crab cannery in its heyday. Though an iconic delicacy today, crab was not as popular in the late 1800s as it is now. But the Colburn and Jewett firm was one of a good number of companies that helped change and popularize what I grew up knowing as a Maryland staple. Appreciating and supporting the small towns in your state is important, and so when I get a day or two, I prioritize visiting and learning about the agricultural history of my state. Plus, this area is just beautiful. And yes, this Maryland girl who loves all things crab enjoyed fresh seafood along the waterfront. For me, it's the simple pleasures that bring great joy. Right off of Talbot Street, you'll find the Parsonage Inn, a Victorian bed and breakfast that dates back to 1883. It's a charming, cozy spot right across the entrance to the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum parking lot, and it's in walking distance to all of the restaurants and shops in town. Embarrassingly, it's been a while since I had been on a bike ride, but boy was this the place to explore. Paved biking paths led through beautiful pastures and bridges. I often found myself stopping to take in the sights.
The morning I left, I enjoyed a cup of joe at a lodge that was established in 1867. And on the drive home, I had to stop at Mill Creek Farm. This place has an amazing selection of preserves, Amish groceries, farm fresh produce, and homemade goodies. Here's what I grabbed. If you missed last month's pantry chat or you want to get more ideas for your pantry, click on the video on your screen. I'll see you in my kitchen or garden soon. Take care, friends. So for all intents and purposes, this video has ended and Lord knows I have chatted your ear off. So this next part is just for those of y'all that are familiar with and connect to my story of when I shared that for the majority of my life, my truest friends have been the elders in my church that I grew up with and just um, older women that um, are older than me by like 30 or 40 decades. During the last five years, I have lost many of them, including my last living grandparent, my Nana. And that's why I am so excited about a new friendship that I have started with my neighbor that lives in the back cul-de-sac area. Her name is Miss Fanny and she is the most energetic 75 year old woman you will ever meet. We are starting to have weekly-ish get-togethers and if you care to be a fly on the wall you can listen to our kitchen table talk that we had the other day. Visiting one-on-one -on -one or with a very small group is my idea of a good time. Now I clipped and skipped around a lot in this conversation but man, I just love the perspective and the stories from older women. Now this is an audio conversation, not a video, so you won't see us. Miss Fanny isn't ready for prime time yet. So I'll likely just add some generic footage. Enjoy. So this is basil. Uh, yes, yep, yep, that's basil. I, were, uh -huh. I don't know stevia. what that is though. That's some of the stevia. So if you wanna make that's tea stevia. with the uh, lemon balm, then you can just add the all natural sugar, you know, right to your I told my cup. sister about you. You know, in the old days when you cooked, I, you cook cabbage, cabbage, the green blowflies would collect on your windows because of the smell. It smells like something dead. Oh, And the blowflies would, so in order to cut down on that scent, they would put green pepper in it. <laughs> and the other day, I was tempted to um, come by after you. Oh, you Because the smell, because I had smelled it before when I had gotten out of the car. Okay. The smell of cooking food. And I said, I looked at all the house, I said, that's Cassandra in there cooking with me. <laughs> well, we had a wood stove. We would sit by the wood stove and he had this big chunk of cheese and he'd slice off a piece for each of, each of us and he was a great storyteller. Oh, my goodness. He would tell goodness. stories and we'd be chomping on that cheese. Cheese, yes. <laughs> oh, you know, it was that bad time. Yeah, It was just so wonderful. Each hen lays the same pattern of eggs. So I was gonna you know, ask you about that. Yeah. So you know. Yeah. If you know the hen, if you can associate the hen with the egg, then you know who. You can track her production. Yeah. 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 There you go. Look at you. All right, farm girl. Oh, I, I'm a farm girl. Uh, yes, you are. <laughs> what do you, like do, what do, you do with the food mill? So it just allows you to like core and stem and separate the seeds and the pulp and the See, sauce just comes we out. All this stuff by hand. Hey, it's still by hand. <laughs> oh my but it's so nice. You're gonna see it in my next video. Or when you come over, you'll see it. Oh. You know, Trey's talking to me. It's not your Apollodine um kettle. I like that. I guess plant. so. I think so. You know, I just you That's know why I have a kettle. Why? I rarely use it. Okay. I when we were kids, we always had a tea kettle. Okay. And mom said, always keep your tea kettle full. You can have four people in your kitchen? And you know, this and I want so a smaller nice. table. Because it's just me now. I want a smaller table. I love having a table. Yeah, because I only have that one little seat. Because when people are over here, and if I'm cooking, I'm like, I can't hear you. Come on over. Uh -huh. You know, but I, this I, is I nice. Love, I love this. Or what the thought was. I don't know either. Was that light fixture isn't even in the middle of the opening? It's for everyone's houses like that. I know. I looked at it. It's so odd. What kind of design is this? I know. They should have just made our kitchens bigger. The different ones who want to come live with me. I said no. It has to be the right ones. No, nobody. Or nobody. Okay, nobody. that too. That you too. Know, like, I think you know. I've, I've seen them there too. These are the. So these, these are hers. Yes, these are the ones that don't fit in the cartons because either they're like. So we were cleaning um, these last night. Girl. Probably, yeah, twelve dollars worth of eggs right there. I don't know Costco's price. <laughs> I don't know what they have, but I have seen. I looked but, yeah. at them and I said, "Those are quail eggs." Up yeah, there. you've processed a chicken before, right? Like you've butchered one. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, we had to. 
We, we raised chickens. We had to slaughter those chickens and chop their heads off and yeah. tie so, their feet so they wouldn't run away so you'd know where it is. So that's what I'm getting ready to do tomorrow for the first time ever. It's traumatic. Don't say that. Well, I want you to be prepared. We're going to put them in the kill cones. What's that? So it's basically, um, Crystal has this, it's a regular like traffic stop cone, like the orange cones. Uh huh. And then it's secured to a fence. Uh huh. So we suspend it upside down. Cut the yeah, and then you cut like in a yeah. the jugular uh-huh. or underneath the jaw, and then we take them out and put them in the spinner, you know, thingy. Did you see my new flag out front? Ah, uh, what's has, it say? Um, it's actually staked in the grass. It's a French bulldog. It's supposed no, to look I like haven't seen that. Oh, okay, I haven't seen. It. I look at <laughs> and it's it. Got it on clearance at low. Because we look- do you go to Second Avenue a lot? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I go there too. I go to Second Avenue. These shoes are from there, and these are Earth Origin. I found so many almost. Brand new shoes. Me too. What size you wear? I'm like eight and a half, nine. I wear nine. Yeah. And a half narrow and ten. And I'm narrow too. So yeah. I cannot find shoes. So I go in there. I find uh, them all the time. I found. No, I bought these. But okay. my doctor told me I should always wear Clarks. I have so many Clarks. He told me, and you find them in and there too. Yes. I, he told me to wear Clarks and all those high end shoes. Exactly. I'm not gonna buy those. I'm not gonna spend my money on that stuff. But I go over there, I find Clarks of all kind, and I and I tell Keen is another good brand. How do you K-E-E-N. spell it? K E E N. I've got some of those. Yeah. Out, some, and I like sandals in the summer. Yeah. Cause my feet are not. See, look at these toes. I got these long toes. They're pretty though. For it. I, I, my toenails aren't painted or anything. I, I just, still have them out. I just. I'm gonna try these. I'll let you know. Okay. Yeah. I'll let you know. Okay. Tomorrow will be my. I'm gonna try them tomorrow for breakfast. Yeah, and I do have tons more. So well, let me start off with this. I don't want her to feel overwhelmed if I give her twice the amount. Yeah, but well, I have them. I'm gonna give them a try. I okay. honestly am. Okay. But I, it's. I tell you, you know, sometimes things just go right. You know how you want to do something? Mm Mm-hmm. And things just fall into place. Absolutely. I said, because I was interested in quail eggs, but I said, I don't know anybody who eats those things. (laughs) But I bet when I talked to my brother-in-law, because he's a a huntsman, how do you cook it? Just like a small little chicken. Oh, That's all, Yeah. Like a little Cornish hen. It's just a little smaller than that. Because I have one of those Ron Popel... Set it, forget it things. What are those? It's a rotisserie. Oh, oh a fancy little things. thing. Yeah. Okay. I just got this clay roaster. It's the Romertoff. I've seen those. Yeah, I found it at Second Avenue. I know. If you know what you're looking for, you can come out there with some jewels of All stuff. All the time. Yes. They have an even larger one now, but it does come out super, super moist because normally mm-hmm. I just put it in cast iron, yeah, yeah. but sometimes it does dry out on me. You know, yeah. if I get busy doing some other things, yeah. I'm like, oh, I forgot to take I, it out. You know, I believe there's strength in prayer. Yeah, he said, I've been working it. since I was three. I said, what you doing, three-year-olds? He said, we they, they live next to the railroad track. They brought the coal up out the mine, yeah. deep in the earth. And his job was to pick up the little things of coal in his tiny bucket and bring it home so they would have coal for the stoves. We went out. I went out with him on a Friday night. I talked to Ray on a Saturday night. Monday, I was gone. Next week, Ray and I got married. Oh, my gosh. Oh, I didn't realize it was that fast. we married for 32 years. He was perfect. Hungry for the road all my life. Thirsty for adventure all my youth Chasing all my freedoms down Liberty Avenue